From Idaho to Texas, product to senior housing. My guest today is Nick Walsh, co-founder of Global Senior Housing, whose awareness of the inevitability of cyclical downturns is complemented by his willingness to adapt to them. Welcome to the National Real Estate Forum podcast, episode 217. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining me today. I am Dr. Adam Gower and this is the Crowdfund Project at nreforum.org where developers, investors and industry leaders share insights that you can use to raise capital, build wealth and earn passive income from crowdfunded real estate deals. How can you invest in real estate without ever actually having to buy a building or a piece of land? This is not a trick question because the answer is, of course, that you can invest in a crowdfund real estate deal and completely avoid all of the brain damage of actually having to develop a project yourself. Real estate is incredibly competitive. Finding good opportunities requires combing through hundreds of deals before finding the right ones and then competing tooth and nail with seasoned professionals to get ahead of them to win the deal. It requires years of expertise, perseverance, and creativity in seeing opportunity where others do not see it. Even then, once a building or a deal has been put up, and creativity in seeing opportunity where others do not see it. Even then, once a building or a deal has been put under contract to buy, there is an arduous time-restrained period during which the developer has to underwrite the risks by conducting thorough due diligence. Once that is done and the project purchased, then the real work starts the development or renovation process itself. As an investor, the opportunity that crowdfund real estate investing offers is that all you need to do is to select from the best of the best of the developers out there and invest with them. You don't have to search for the deals or conduct the due diligence, deal with local planning departments or manage contractors. You can cherry pick the best deals with the best sponsors so that all that is left for you to do is to double check their due diligence work product. It is real estate investing without any competition. It's a bit like picking the winner of a race after the race has already been run. Of course, there are huge risks, and even, but you can manage that risk to some extent by being fully informed, not only of the deal itself, but also in how to understand exactly what it is that you're looking at. Real estate, like any industry, is steeped in jargon, so I've put together a glossary of real estate crowdfunding terms in plain English for you, absolutely free. You can download a copy at the show notes page for today's episode at the National Real Estate Forum.org website at nreforum.org forward slash Nick, N-I-C-K. Feel free to let me know if there are any terms I've missed that you would like to see explained. In the second of my sponsor conversations, today I am pleased to introduce you to Nick Walsh, who is co-founder of Global Senior Housing. Nick discovered the challenges of how real estate cycles can impact even the best of developers during the last downturn. Deciding to engage in a type of development that had greater resilience to the ups and downs of the general market, he discovered a lack of supply in senior housing, but a lack of supply in senior housing and has been developing in that space for the last few years. His strategy is to form strategic partnerships with regional operators to manage the marketing, lease up and operations while he and his father handle finance and construction management. Be sure to check out the show notes for today's episode at nreforum.org forward slash Nick for links to the company website, a transcript to today's episode, and of course, access to the staggeringly fabulous glossary of crowdfund real estate terms that I put together for you. I'm a co-owner of Global Senior Housing. We develop senior living projects in the uh, western states. And before we formed Global Senior Housing about four years ago, I developed residential subdivisions with my father, who was my partner then and is my partner now. And uh, that was you know, development of subdivisions in Idaho. That's relatively new to the to the senior housing space. And we've, we've got a small company. We do projects in uh, Texas, Arizona, and Idaho at the moment. And prior to the residential subdivision development business, I um, was in the accounting industry with KPMG, so a finance background before I got into a real estate development. Okay, and uh, so the senior housing learning curve must have been quite steep. How did you get into that? How did you decide? It to was steep, housing? you know. You know, after the last downturn, we we started looking at 
you know, what other asset class we could get into to develop projects that was less cyclical than the residential uh, industry. So we landed on senior housing through an associate we had in Idaho who developed smaller projects, they call them cottage cottage tile products or okay. projects where there, there are multiple smaller buildings on a site, kind of a campus of 16 unit, full smaller buildings on a site, kind of a campus of 16 unit buildings. And you know, Boise is a pretty small town, so it's easy to to find people in the you know find and talk to people and find someone who's who's you know doing what you want to get into. So they were developing some projects in Texas, and we uh, you know senior housing a lot like the hotel industry is extremely operations intensive. Pretty much the you know as long as you get a good site and line up good financing partners, um, the operations really is is what makes and makes and breaks a the success of a project. So going into the senior industry, yeah, we we wanted to partner with with a successful, experienced operator, you know, who knew what they were doing and sort of leverage off their experience versus trying to, you know, start an operating team ourselves. Okay, so then you started, so what did you do? You started looking for sites to develop that they thought were conducive to building a site to develop that they thought were conducive to building a senior housing project, and then you put the deal Exactly, yeah, they had kind of had a building prototype that they knew how to operate that they had built before, so when we partnered with them, we came on to raise the capital and you know, find and acquire sites. So we, you know, form parameters, kind of have a market study methodology that we use to look at demographics and, you know, the supply and demand in certain areas. And so we just focus on Texas to start. And we, you know, canvassed the whole state looking for, you know, the right right markets that were underserved for assisted living and memory care and um, that had the, you know, the right demographics for a project to build their next project. And that's how we got started with our first project. And that project was in Houston. And that's that's the project we're here to talk about today is a crowdfunding project. So actually our first senior housing project we did was with a crowdfunding raise. Interesting. Idaho. So we, you know, had a had a group of Idaho investors that, you know, understand understood the residential market and, you know, we're in the state of Idaho. Oh. So that's that's how we financed our residential subdivisions in Idaho was, you know, investor syndications, but all really all local investors uh, in the Boise area. How did you come to know them? Family family business. You know, my my dad's been in real estate development in, in the area for you know, 25 years. So just uh, building up those investors over the year. I see. In Boise. Right. Okay. All right. So what made you decide to seek a different kind of finance for your first senior? Yeah. You know, going down to Texas with a project, we knew we needed to expand our pool of investors and I mean, we prefer the private investor syndication uh, route for for projects of of this equity under five million dollars. That's kind of you know where we anything under that we feel like we feel like a, a investor syndication is is you know the best platform for us. So when we were going out of the state of Idaho, we just knew we needed to expand that, and so that's why we we started looking at the crowdfunding platforms as the quickest way to do that. And when was this, Nick? Uh, this was three years ago. Okay, so it was quite a, a new concept at that time. What what drew you to it? How did you discover it, and how did you decide who to go with? You know, we discovered it through when I was when I was talking to a few, you know, at, at some real estate conferences. I had talked to a few real estate attorneys who. You know, we're starting to put together PPM work, you know, do PPM work for, you know, this this infamous, you know, Reg D and, and the uh that was right about the time that the Jobs Act was D and, and the uh that was right about the time that the Jobs Act was getting approved and they were formulating the rules for that. So there's just a lot of buzz in the industry about this, you know, this crowdfunding as a as a way to raise money. Okay, and then you had to figure out which platform you were going to go with. What was the process for discovering what platforms were out there and which might be appropriate for you? Right. Well, you know, there, there's a ton of them, and and even back then there was there was probably twenty or thirty companies um, out there that I, I researched and and 
I, I really started with who who does ground up development. You know, a lot of these companies were in their their infancy, so I really wanted to dial in who who was raising money for ground up development projects versus companies that just raise money for you know existing stabilized assets or even reposition you know assets. So, um, or even reposition, you know, assets. So um, that really, you know, took the number from from 30 down to maybe a handful at that point. And then what about senior housing? Presumably that narrowed it down a bit as well. It did, it did. I, I definitely I definitely looked at each platform and who had raised, done a successful raise on a senior housing, housing successful raise on a senior housing, housing project before. And that's kind of how I... How I landed on um, on the the platform, the company that we ended up partnering with, which is Crowd Street, and they had just completed a, a successful raise for a larger skilled nursing developer. Who um, I forget the amount, but I think it was over two million dollars. Um, it wasn't the entire the entire equity raise for that for that company, but they used it to um, you know they used it to complement the rest of the equity they were raising. So. And I, I just read about that in a senior housing publication that this company had a had a successful raise on Crowd Street, and so that prompted me to to call them. So now, what was their reaction to you having not done a senior housing deal before? How did you persuade them that this was a viable deal? Right, and yeah, that was that was a you know that was a discussion, and and that's kind of where our, our joint venture with our operator partner comes into play is leverage off of their experience in the industry. And, um, you know, as far as our role in the, in the joint venture, um, a lot of it's on the, you know, land development and construction side. And at that point in time, uh, we had already had the project entitled, you know, so we're raising equity for an entitled project. And really our, you know, role for the rest of the project is to uh, manage the financing and, and manage the construction of the building and rely on our operators, um, you know, resume, which really helps, you know, with our approval with CrowdStreet, but also with the, the equity raise with the investors. All right. So walk me through the process from when you called CrowdStreet and said, hello, I'm Nick, and I want to do a senior housing deal in Texas, to when you started to receive mm -hmm. funds from investors. Right. Well, I, I approached CrowdStreet with actually a different project, and they they turned it down because the market was a tertiary market in Texas, and that allowed me to bring another project. And really, the reason was, it was yeah, it wasn't as a, in a major metro. And at the time that we did the raise, that's really what investors were looking for. Most investors were looking for you know a city that that they knew that they felt comfortable in, you know, there was in a major metro. So I was able to bring bring back this project in Houston that met you know met the criteria. Okay. So you brought a second deal to them and now you know that it's more aligned with their underwriting requirements, presumably. How did they articulate their requirements to you? In what way how detailed were they? You know, it, the underwriting requirements they, they looked at of course the the sponsor group who the you know, operator was and who the developer was and, you know, what the, you know, we had a third party market study that, you know, justified the demand in the market for the building that we were going to build. But beyond that, it, that's one thing we, we liked about Crow Street is they, you know, looked at the deal thing we, we liked about Crow Street is they, you know, looked at the deal structure and sort of didn't really mandate a deal structure like like some platforms do, but uh, they guided us through what would be successful because you know we're putting up the fees you know for the raise whether we're successful or not, and they don't want you know they don't want to blemish you know a bad raise a raise that's unsuccessful. So they were able to really work with us on how to structure the deal so that it would be successful once it got on the platform. <laughs> Don't forget to pick up your free plain English glossary of crowdfund real estate terms by going to the show notes for today's episode at the National Real Estate Forum.org website, nreforum.org forward slash Nick. And let me know what you think. You can also find a transcript for today's episode at the bottom of that page. So they charge a, an upfront fee to do the page. So they charge a an upfront fee to do the raise. Do they? Is that how it works? Right. They charge an upfront fee and then really just an annual 
call it a maintenance fee for their platform, which is on our website, you know, on our investors link. So we actually have a their white label software um, incorporated into our website where the investors go in and log in. So, so from the investor's perspective, they're dealing directly with you and not with CrowdStreet. Correct. And that's what differentiates a lot of platforms. Some platforms now are operating like equity shops where they, you know, they will actually fund the deal and then backfill, you know, the raise with investors and sell it later on. Uh, CrowdStreet's more of a, was more of a marketplace. It's more of a marketplace where they're really just a middleman between you and the investors. So, you know, they're, they're exposing your project to their uh, it's that, you know, investor contact you know, directly is what we were looking for. We we wanted to build our investor pool and have, you know, build those relationships with the investor direct so that when we went and did the next deal, they'd be there. And does CrowdStreet have any control over what you're doing in any way? You know, they check in with us. Um, of course, on the front end, yes, we had, you know, a checklist of documents that you know, we needed to submit for the for the raise uh, before it would go live. From here on out, here on out, it's really you know I work with you know, I have a designated investor relations um, as well as you know customer relations person who checks in with me and makes sure we have everything we need you know to to communicate with our investors effectively and and you know make sure everybody's happy. So yeah, if if an investor has a question, sometimes they contact, they can contact CrowdStreet and CrowdStreet will connect me. Um, but, some, um, but sometimes they, they just connect, connect with me direct, and email or call me direct. In your, in your operating agreement, are there any rights that CrowdStreet retains in the event that you don't meet pro forma no. or you're on time or nothing, no, no controls no. like that at all? No, CrowdStreet's simp- simply a, a middleman marketplace that gets paid a fee to broadcast broadcast your project out to their investor network. So your operating agreement was one that you generated and then put it out to investors on a kind of take it or leave it basis. Correct. Exactly. We had a we had an operating agreement inside of a private placement memorandum and with a you know subscription agreement and when it came time to invest it was between the investor and ourselves you know in our, in our project so they were investing directly in the project was there much negotiation on that or even attempts at negotiation on that or even attempts at negotiation on that on the part of investors or yeah you know some some investors would some investors would you know say hey i'd i'd like this deal if you had you know a higher preferred return, or I'd like this deal if, you know, you were putting in more sponsor equity, you know, every bit, you know, some of the investors would say that and then would still invest. Some of them would, would, you know, go in a different direction. But yeah, I think they kind of, they all understand that at this point, once a, once a project gets to, gets to that level, gets posted on the marketplace, that it's really a, a take it or leave it proposition. All right. So tell me how much money you raised and how did how did that process go? You went you went live one day, and then what happened? Yeah, we went live. Um, we completed the raise in about seventy five days. To the you know last dollar was deposited into escrow from deposited into escrow from when we placed the project on the marketplace. Seventy five day cycle. We raised one point two million, and we had about another. Another three hundred thousand in sponsor equity that we were placing into the project, okay. and of that one point two, that was comprised of forty four investors. And the range of investments. Range of investments. When we were, that's one thing that CrowdStreet helped us with. We came in with a fifty thousand dollar minimum. They said, I think you're going to have a lot more success with this project if you reduce it to a twenty five thousand dollar minimum. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we had more investors, but you know, some of those investors came in at the twenty five thousand dollar level. So it went anywhere from twenty five thousand to hundred thousand. And what was the geographical distribution of those investors? And where did they come from? Were they primarily through CrowdStreet or did you do any marketing yourself? We did a little marketing on did you do any marketing yourself? We did a little marketing on our, you know, on our own. Like I said, we had some investors in Idaho that wanted to get into the senior living space, so a few of them invested with us. But 
a majority of the investors came from CrowdStreet's marketplace. And geographically, we had, of course, many investors from Texas since the project was in Houston. But really, it was it was across the board. I saw, you know, probably most most of the investors were from the West Coast or the Western states. We had a few, you know, some investors from the Northeast, from the East Coast, but a majority were from the West Coast. And do you have any idea what kind of demographic your investors are? You know, demographics, I'm not sure. I mean, it was an, it was an you know, 100% accredited raise. So we had to vet out, you know, the accreditation of each investor. Yeah, CrowdStreet. Yeah, they they ran all the um, they ran all the accreditation for the investors. Exactly. And I can tell you, you know, from the investors that I talked to, I would probably say I'd probably say half were real estate professionals who understand the real, you know, have a background in the real estate industry who were, you know, just want to diversify into you know crowdfunding projects. Um, the other half. You know, I I would say, or you know, other professionals, you know, families, uh, family trusts, who you know maybe taking their money from from stocks and putting them into re- you know real estate through through crowdfunding. What were the biggest challenges you found through this process? What were the biggest challenges and the biggest surprises to you? You know, the the raise got got started real fast. We probably raised half the money in the first probably in the first twenty days or so, and then it slow down project on the marketplace, you know, it comes up first. So everybody's seeing it. Everybody goes to, you know, goes to the crowdfunding site and they see your project. So you get a lot of activity. And then as more projects get posted, yours kind of drops down and maybe, you know, it takes someone a little bit, a little bit longer to find you. So that's one, I would say that's one challenge is, you know, if people are going out to, you know, look at a platform to do a raise on is, how many projects are they posting? So is, is your project going to get caught up in the wash and not really get the attention that it needs to to complete the raise? I mean, so so it slowed down, but it still only took 75 days to to raise the rest of the money. And I would say because since the platform was investor to you know sponsor direct, I mean, I I spent a lot of time on the phone with potential investors, a lot of time, you know, answering emails, you know, really spending time with, with each potential investor um, so they could vet out the potential investor um, so they could vet out the project. So that's just one thing. I mean, it, it takes a lot of time and that, you know, it takes a lot of time and energy. So if you don't have someone in your company who is fully devoted to, you know, investor relations to the raise, to, to field those calls and those questions, it can probably bog you down. <laughs> And how is it different then from having raised money before from your select group in Boise, Idaho for prior deals? Presumably, you also had to answer questions that they might have. So how is it different from that? It's just a condensed period of time. I mean, you're you're putting this thing up. And since we, you know, since we can't post or it's not a good idea to post, actually, I don't even think we could um, post our project until we had entitlements and you know, we were ready to start construction. It's really the the timeline. You're looking for a quick raise, get it up there, uh, raise the money and start construction. So other projects we do, you know, start construction. So other projects we do, you know, you can, you can start talking to folks, you know, through the entitlement process. So you may have six to 12 months to, you know, gather your, your investor group together. Why were you unable to do that? CrowdStreet wouldn't let you? Yeah, CrowdStreet, CrowdStreet's looking for products that are ready to go because they don't want to post your project and have investors commit to then wait for you to get entitlements, which could be an extra, you know, three, six months down the line. And the investors, because I mean, the investors want to place their money now. They're not really, you know, the likelihood that they're going to be around in six months or have those funds to invest in six months is unrealistic. So yeah, it was it was really, you know, that's one of the, the parameters that CrowdStreet has is, is you need to have your entitlements in place and you know ready to start construction once you fund. Right. So what were your biggest likes and dislikes about the process? You know, I I like the dislikes about the process. You know, I I like the I really appreciated the our ability to increase our investor pool and work directly with investors. We've, you know, now 
talked to some investors. You know, some investors have come to me and said, hey, next project you guys do that you're, you know, doing another raise, we're interested. Um, so it's been a really good way to expand our investor pool. And I just, I just like the idea of, of giving people, I like the idea of crowdfunding. I like the, the idea of giving people the ability, you know, all over the place, no matter where they are, the ability to, you know, do their own research, invest in a real estate project that, you know, before they saw it, they might not have known you know anything about senior housing, but they were still able to own a piece of a project. I and mean, that's just a pretty cool concept. As far as dislikes, there's nothing that I really disliked about the process to have that direct contact with investors and, you know, you know, make sure they get all their questions answered and that it just takes a lot of work. So that's, that's probably, you know, from talking to people out there, you know, when I, when I tell them we, we did a crowdfunding raise, they always say, Oh yeah, like dealing with that many investors or, you know, trying to manage that all. It's just, that's not for us. You know, we'd rather just go to one person, go to a, you know, fund manager, or a, you know, private equity company where we have, you know, one person calling us, you know, ask, asking us things. So it's not for everybody. Well, how do you respond to that when people say, well, you know, isn't it easier to go to a private equity fund? Isn't it more expensive to go to a private equity fund? It is fund more than- expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of one of, when we were going out to, because crowdfunding wasn't, I mean, this wasn't, you know, when we started this project, we didn't know we were going to do crowdfunding for our equity raise. We were going out there and we were talking to private equity groups and, you know, a $1.2 million raise pension. So if it's under that, we really found that if it's under that $5 million mark, all these private equity groups, I mean, they're putting the same amount of work into our deal to place a fifth of the equity uh, as they would just to work on one one other project. So we really didn't... Um, even though we had a good project, you know, a good sponsor group, just the, the equity raise amount alone shut the door with, with a lot of groups. In addition to that, yeah, it, it is more expensive. I mean, you go to, not only more expensive um, with your structure, you can get a, so you can get a better, you know, retain a larger percentage of the project by going with a crowdfunding raise, but also the control. I mean, like you, like we talked about earlier, there's really no negotiation. You structure your deal, you know, to be successful. You post it, and the investors have a choice to invest or not invest. So you're working with a, a private equity group. They're, you know, they're going to negotiate with you. They're going to, you know, take more of the project, a larger percentage of the project, in the percentage of the project, in the operating agreement. They're going to want certain, you know, management controls over you, which well, can give me, kinda, give me. Give me a couple examples of those that you would expect to see in a private equity deal, but that you don't see in the crowdfunded environment. They may have certain reporting requirements that, you know, based on where they get their money, they might have you give them more extensive reporting requirements or audited financials, for instance, um, which is just another step for you as a sponsor. They also may have, you know, put in management decision-making controls on certain things, like when you can sell, when you can refinance, certain budgetary controls, you know, what you can do with, with your budget. So across the board, it's just, it, it's, you know, I guess it, working with a private equity group takes more of the management out of your hands. All right. So now, of course, this was three years ago, Nick. The question, of course, is, go, Nick. The question, of course, is, how's the deal going? It's leasing up now. It's yeah, that's the thing about ground up senior living projects. You spend years in entitlements and construction and then you get to spend years in the, the lease up process too. Are you on budget, on time? We're a little bit behind on time, I'm not gonna lie. You know, it took us longer <laughs> to right. get through construction and licensing. Well, um, you know what, if you told me that you were on time, uh, then I wouldn't believe you anyway. So Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, All right, we, so a little done. You know, every every quarter we we send those investor distribution checks, so that's the most important thing. Hey, when did that kick in then? Because you were ground up. So when did those distribution checks start? Yeah, you know we um, that's one thing that Crow Street advised us on is to pay a uh, current distribution every quarter from inception. current distribution every quarter from inception. Yeah, we had to raise a little bit more money, and now we. You know, we oh. um, give that that distribution every quarter back to the investors. Interesting. Okay. When do you expect to be cash positive on that or break even? With this project, once we hit about 
do senior living projects once we hit about 60% occupancy. Okay. And where are you now? Uh, we're not there yet. Okay. <laughs> Is this a long-term hold deal, or is this a lease uh, stabilize and sell project? You know, our our strategy going into this, we really look at it uh, as a three-year recapitalization. We underwrote a five-year sale with a refinance in year three. Um, it was structured with a we went out and got a construction mini perm loan that went out went out three years. So we 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 looked at it at you know, we presented it as we're returning your equity with a refinance in three years or with a sale potentially in three years. But we're with this type of project, we're, you know, this cottage style product product, we're building them all over Texas. So the most advantageous sales situation would be a portfolio sale, you know, with eight smaller projects um, versus just trying to go out and sell sell one off. So that's how we're that's how we're looking at looking at this platform. If we can build, you know, we're, we're we finished the first two projects and we're about halfway through building the third project. So between us and our operators' current portfolio, they'll have they'll have seven projects by the end of the year. And these other two so, projects that you've done have they also been crowdfunded? They have not been crowdfunded. Oh. Subsequent to the crowdfund raise, we um, partnered with a Dallas paper from coming from private investors, but they did the syndication work and came in you know, as a partner. So they brought their own money in. So their distinction is between them and CrowdStreet was that they are syndicating for you in a similar way, but they're actually also putting some risk Correct. equity they, into the deal as well. Yeah, they had been, they're an established, established equity group in Texas who had a lot of investors coming to them saying, hey, we want to get in the senior living space. So they were a natural fit for us to do several projects with within Texas. But yeah, it it was more expensive, you know? Not doing the syndication work ourselves cost us quite a bit in ownership. So tell me why. I mean, that's a big decision, right? It's really the crux of the crowdfund proposition. Come to us instead. It is. We made the decision because it's uh, scalability. We were able to partner with a group who can provide a group who can provide you know programmatic equity for multiple projects and take that I guess take that speed up that process and provide that assurance for that you're going to be able to raise the equity for a project like for example remember the pro the project I told you that CrowdStreet didn't approve it was in yeah. a tertiary market. Mm -hmm. This group, since they're in Texas, they understood that market. You know, they were, the manager was able to drive down and take a look at the site and say, yeah, we understand the dynamics around this tertiary market. We'll invest in it. So if a project doesn't, yeah, you know, because – and that's part of our platform is going into these smaller markets that won't work for a crowdfunding platform. Will they take entitlement risk as well? They have not taken entitlement risk yet, no. That would again. That would probably you know, you'd probably have to give up more ownership in the project if they were you know going on the risk with to give up more ownership in the project if they were you know going on the risk with going on, going on that entitlement risk. So we're fine taking that on ourselves still. So you don't have any more planned for crowdsourced finance. We do potentially. We um, are looking at an acquisition, a reposition project. Um, in Austin, and when investors look at your project or sign up on CrowdStreet, they can put the markets that they want to invest in, the markets that they're interested in. And Austin popped up on a lot of lists for a lot of investors, so that's one potential deal. The fact that it has in place cash flow and that it's in Austin, and it's a 1.3 million dollar raise. So because of all that, I think it I think it'd be a good raise, good second raise. As a real estate guy, what are the key daily habits that you have to make your business daily habits that you have to make your business successful? That's a great question. One thing is is getting up three hours before you have an important meeting or an important call at the minimum. So if you've got to be in into work at nine, get up at six. Start preparing yourself. Don't be rushed in the morning. You know, work out in the morning. Have a good breakfast, 
and just prepare yourself every morning, kind of get in, into a ritual or routine. And, and just that kind of leads into just being healthy, you know, maintaining your health. When you're in the real estate development business, it's, it can be stressful, it can wear on you physically. So just maintaining good eating habits and good workout habits, you know, dealing with that stress is much easier. If I, if I go two days without working out, I can feel it. I can feel it in my, my stress levels. All right. So then my second question is, what has been the hardest lesson you have learned in real estate? I would say the hardest lesson when you're getting into a new asset class, it'll take at least three times as long, longer than you expected when you were going into it. It's really just the timing. You can never rely on timing of any development project. You always got to build in contingencies and, and you know capitalize yourself and your business for the long run and expect it to take yeah at least three times as long as you think. <laughs> Exactly right. Always stay, happens. Stay longer. Yeah. <laughs> Always happens. All right. And then my third question, if you could give one piece of advice to, to somebody who hasn't invested in real estate before, what would it be? I would say fully understand what you're investing in um, and invest in something that you, that you enjoy, that you understand and that you, you like. Don't invest in something just because you think it's going to make you a lot of money. Making a lot of money is great, but you should enjoy not only what you're investing in, but who you're investing with. Nick's adopted field of senior housing is a highly specialized area of real estate development. It is operations intensive and similar in some ways, but even more so than operating a hotel, which doesn't have any of the skilled medical and nursing requirements that a senior housing facility does. In my course on how to invest in real estate crowdfund deals, I get into this in a little bit more detail. And I've also constructed an entire seminar on how to invest in senior housing deals as a crowdfund investor. Contact me at the National Real Estate Forum.org website, nreforum.org forward slash contact, and I will send you further information on that. The next podcast will be with Tor Steen, CEO and co-founder of CrowdStreet. CrowdStreet, of course, was the platform that Nick used to raise capital for his first senior housing project. So hearing Tor speak from the platforms and what is involved in operating a real estate crowdfund online marketplace. You can subscribe to this podcast series by going to the National Real Estate Forum.org website, nreforum.org, and hitting any of the links that I've included about halfway down the homepage for whatever platform you listen to podcasts. If I manage the tech right, the subscription process should only be a couple of clicks away. Thanks for tuning in, and thank you also to Nick Walsh, co-founder of Global Senior Housing, for sharing your time with me today. Until next time, this is Dr. Adam Gower signing off.